Hello everybody, I think this is the first time I remembered to turn on my mic when I switched over to uh, the next stream. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> is, it, is he talking, Trim? I, I can see his lips moving. I don't hear anything. I wonder if he remembered to turn his mic on. Guys, we didn't say that we were going to be roasting and joking on me the whole the whole show. Funny bits. <laughs> I think it was assumed. Yeah. Um, so, of course, I think these two next to me really don't need any, any introduction, but let's go ahead and give them one. Uh, hey, everybody, who are we uh, talking with today? Uh, I, I'm Travis McElroy. I am the middlest McElroy brother and the middlest McElroy son. And I host just a bunch of podcasts, uh, probably most notably uh, The Adventure Zone, uh, which my father co-hosts with me, as well as my brothers, and my brother, my brother and me, which uh, my two brothers, Justin and Griffin, also host with me, and Schmanners, which I do with my wife, and there's many other projects. We were just in Trolls World Tour, a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, and I'm Clint McElroy. I am the uh, Pater Familia. Uh, the, uh, I guess I'm the head of the whole thing, I guess, <laughs> in my mind. Um, the father of Travis and Justin and Griffin, grandfather of uh, BB and Dot and Charlie and Cooper and Henry, and um, one of the co-hosts of the Adventure Zone. <laughs> co-host of the Adventure Zone and um one of the co-writers on uh, the adventure zone graphic novel series and uh, general bon vivant man about town and the more well, not I'm, lately yeah especially right now i'm also looking at us kind of like close to side by side and dad is also apparently like me in in 30 years there but it's almost it's uncanny looking at it <laughs> that i'm like this you don't even oh. need the app watch no. watch watch this <laughs> Every time I Dude. post a picture, people are like, "You look like your dad." I want to be like, "Yeah, that is how genetics work." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure do. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, somebody, I forget where it was. I think I saw a side by side picture of you, Clint, um, around Travis's age, and it was pretty uncanny. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, it was. It was absurd. Um, uh, if I may, too, just to go ahead and, like, right off the bat and say, if you are watching this and you are enjoying this, please consider uh, becoming a, a donor uh, and supporting Extra Life for Kids and, and this endeavor, this fundraiser. Um, it's a great cause, and you could do it. How how can people, Adam, how can people uh, become a donor? Uh, Sash, could you go ahead and post that link, please? Uh, there we go, right there. Uh, Sash is on it. Sash has been uh, amazing, taking care of kind of the stream moderation for me while I've been... Uh, running some events so you can go to that link and donate um even just one dollar really does go a long way and every single donor a one dollar and up however much you donate uh will be entered into this absurd amount of giveaways we're doing uh right below me is a list of all of our donors and um we gave away like five things last night and we still have about eight more giveaways one of which is a D, &D beyond uh, source book collection that they donated, which Ooh. shout out to D and D Beyond. Yeah, that was huge. We've got uh, uh, still dice or um, dice gift cards and character commissions and dice trays, just tons of con uh, tons of stuff that we will still be giving away later in the evening, and that is for everybody who donates even just one dollar. So, uh, I'm also going to say I just decided to do this. But any money uh, donated while Dad and I are on here for the next hour, I'll match it. Holy cow! So, yeah, I'll just do a matching thing for any money we raise in the next hour. So that's even better. Spend my money to help some kids. <laughs> that is a challenge right there. That is uh, that is very exciting. Uh, one thing I will note um, on one of the layouts uh, yesterday. Whenever somebody would donate, there was this loud kind of cash register noise, and mm -hmm. I, for the life of me, could not find out where that thing was coming from. I didn't have, <laughs> I didn't have any sources. You didn't have somebody standing there going, ching! <laughs> I think it was. I think maybe my brother was messing with me or something, because, uh, but I don't know if it's going to be on this layout or not. This is a new one, so we will see. Yes, um, so Extra Life, if you don't know, it's kind of a gamers, tabletop gamers, uh, vi uh, video game gamers, all... Um, you know, do things like this, uh, fundraisers like this, where they stream games and then they uh, raise money for children's hospitals. Uh, we and you get to pick the children's hospital. We chose Cincinnati Children's Hospital because 
all of us from uh, both of our shows are from um, Cincinnati, and this is the uh, the hospital that our kids use. So we do it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't know how to turn that down. I've tried. Um, so yeah, uh, speaking of Cincinnati, I know Travis, you're from Cincinnati. Um, I did want to kind of just start um, with a, a few, uh, a little bit of a Cincinnati um, block here. So first off, right off the bat, Gold Star or Skyline? I think that's important. Not Skyline. Either. Wait, what did Sky you say, Travis? Neither. Oh, we had another. There, somebody just donated a hundred dollars. Thank you, Demi. Um. So, here's the thing. Well, okay, I'll I'll, t I'll take a step back. So, anyone who's watching who doesn't know, Cincinnati style chili is not chili. It is like a a meat sauce, right? It is, I believe, Greek, uh, in origin originally, and so it is like uh meat and sauce, and the secret ingredients are like chocolate and cinnamon. <laughs> And so it's not sweet, but it definitely is uh, like more on the sweeter side of a sauce than savory. So if you think of it as chili, it is not great, but it is never eaten alone. It is eaten on spaghetti or on hot dogs. That kind conies, of thing. conies. So, so if you have it on a coney, I don't mind. Uh, I, I I actually think I might prefer Gold Star in, in that circumstance. But if you Skyline. have it on spaghetti, I think I prefer Skyline. But if someone said, "Do you want to eat it?" I would say no. <laughs> if it's the only thing that's there, I will consume it. And but I'm a Skyline guy because I like their jingle. It's Skyline time. It's very smooth. <laughs> um, but I have had, like, you know, I, it, the thing is, is, like, the people who ask, like, Skyline or, or Gold Star is, like, to me, like, saying, what's your favorite hamburger? Burger King or McDonald's, <laughs> and it's like, well, not neither. <laughs> I would much rather go somewhere else. So I've had Cincinnati South Chili, other places, like fancier, nicer places, and I've enjoyed that a lot more. But now, if you want a burger, if you want a great burger, my favorite place to get a burger is actually in Cincinnati. Oh. Are you gonna say it's Terry's Turf Club? Terry's Turf Club, overpriced. The not, best, you are incorrect, sir. We will, they will Terry's not let Turf us Club. back in. The Terry's Turf Club <laughs> is delicious. Listen, they have a wide variety of things they put on their burgers that you can't get anywhere else. I can't believe you. It is, listen, listen. You know what? You know how I know it's not overpriced? Because I took you there and I bought. Nope. I paid. Listen, I'm not saying it's not good. It's very good. I'm saying the best burger for the buck in Cincinnati is that Gaslight Cafe? Oh. The burger is like five bucks and it's delicious. Zip okay. is also fine. Arthur's is, a, I, I would rank mine as uh, Gaslight Cafe, and then, and then Terry's Turf Club, and then Zips. Uh, and I, and four, uh, fifth is homemade. I make a very good burger. <laughs> uh, yeah, the only one of those I've had is. Arnold's, I believe, and Arnold's is very good. They're French fries. Oh, are Arnold's, out yes. Out of this world. Um, so, we mentioned that, Travis, you now live in Cincinnati. Uh, Clint, yes. you live in uh, Huntington, West Virginia. Actually, I live in Ohio. Wait, I live in I Ironton, Ohio. It's the Tri-State. It's basically Huntington. Tri-State, yeah. It's the satellite. It's that and Ashland are, are, in many ways, I consider suburbs to Huntington. And the little the tiny little... Problems. The little uh, blemish down at the very bottom tip of Ohio, that's where we are. Well, this is going to even more complicate this. I, I wanted to kind of get a timeline because I know you all are from West Virginia, right? right. And then moved to Batavia, Ohio, I believe. And that's like uh, five minutes from me right now. Yeah, so basically, for me, the breakdown was, the, like, I'll speed through the whole timeline. Born in uh, West, Huntington, to West Virginia, lived there until I was 18. They moved to Oklahoma for four years, to Norman, Oklahoma, to attend the University of Oklahoma. They moved back to Huntington for like two and a half years. And then Griffin and I moved to Batavia, Ohio, because I wanted to move to Cincinnati. And for some reason, Griffin was like, I guess he, I, he had only ever lived in Huntington. Oh, I, I, not to embarrass him in any way. He is now a grown man who has lived in many big cities. He was worried about living in the big city of Cincinnati. Um, because, like, he he worked from home and stuff working for, at the time, Joystick. And so he was afraid. I, not afraid. 
nervous about being home alone in the big city, which now is so ridiculous to me to think of the the many, many, many sleepy parts of Cincinnati. Anyways, so we uh, moved to Batavia, which is still like a half hour from my drive from Cincinnati. Um, and then lived there for a year, and then I moved into uh, Pleasant Ridge in Cincinnati with my uh, then-girlfriend, now-wife. We lived there for four or five years, then we moved to Los Angeles for two years, and then moved back to Cincinnati, where we have been since 2016. You don't want my timeline. Sorry, Adam. You know <laughs> how long fun. have we got here? We got an hour. <laughs> you don't have enough time to hear my saga. It would make its own podcast. Let's just say. But yeah, I uh, was born in this town, Ironton, Ohio. Oh, and then moved to Florida, Georgia, Nevada, Texas. Back to Florida. Back to Nevada, California. Back to Nevada, and then back to Ironton, Ohio. Then I moved to. Uh, back to Florida and then back to Huntington, West Virginia. And then when I remarried, I on, which is beautiful and kind of sad at the same time. That, that, that explains why you're such like a continental well. Oh, yeah. 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 As he talked with his mouth full of Coke zero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, you know, both of you of uh, being in the area, do either of you have a uh, favorite place in Cincinnati? Restaurant, monument, uh, you know, the zoo. Oh, I, yeah. Okay. So uh, my uh, eldest daughter is uh, about three and a half and we like to go on adventures, right? So like we've been to the zoo a bunch. We have a membership there and like the museum center is really cool uh, and uh, the aquarium in Newport is great, but like one of my favorite places to take people I have two. My favorite places to take people is one on top of Crew Tower, uh, which uh, if you don't count, uh, I think it's the Great American Building or something. It's the tallest building in Cincinnati, and the only reason the other one's taller is they put the uh, the crown jewel on top, which is just this big like wire network thing that you can't go up in so crew tower is like the highest view in cincinnati and it costs like two dollars to go out and you like go up through this art deco building to get up there and it's really cool but the other one is the american sign museum which is just this like like building beautiful like museum of neon signs and they like range from like very like proto neon signs to like golden age neon signs and like the whole thing is beautifully lit and hums and it's just gorgeous and there's one section in it that's like made up to be like a street that you would walk down with like neon signs and everything it's really really cool uh i'm i love great american ballpark i love mm -hmm. going to to games great american but my favorite place <laughs> in Cincinnati is Jungle Gyms. I love Jungle Gyms. My wife Carol and I had one of our first dates to go to Jungle Gyms. I actually proposed in the checkout line. No, so, you, I didn't yes. remember that. Yes. Okay. I have I actually have security video footage because they knew I was going to do it and we were in the middle of uh, of checking out at Jungle Gyms aisle 23 and I went down on one knee and popped out the ring and I proposed to my wife at Jungle Gyms nice and it's one of my one of my favorite places do love great american though love great american and uh, just like I loved Riverfront and loved Crossley Field cuz I've actually seen games in all three places yeah yeah uh, Jungle Gyms is also on my list of like to take out of town for it is it is a spectacle and also a great selection. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna ask, uh, what really draws you to Jungle Gents? Is it just the? Uh, the I frankly, I one, I like to cook and I like to bake, and there's like stuff there that like you can't find anywhere, anywhere else. Uh, and also, man, I'm just a sucker for like British food uk food right. and like they have such a great section of it and it's also fun like that's the thing is like i like to take bb there because it's like i have no idea what this thing is but it looks interesting let's buy it and eat it you know and like that is like a great way to like try new things and you know it's just a spectacle in and of itself it's fun yeah um so i do want to now kind of transition from the cincinnati and uh really get into some uh questions that i know 
all the viewers are more, you know, burning for. That is questions about uh, both you two and also um, your, your shows. Uh, so before we do, just yeah. to remind everybody watching at home, make sure you donate. And for the hour that dad and I are on here, I'm matching whatever we make. So far, it looks like we've raised almost $300 yeah. just in 15 minutes. So awesome. Keep that up. Keep I, going. I, yeah, I did want to give you a heads up for that, Travis. I had to. I had to up the goal. It would look I like understand. we were. <laughs> I understand. Let's keep going. Keep it going. Yeah. For a great cause. And now we're going to get into the, the meat of the, the interview. So um, what is either of yours or both of yours, I mean, uh, absolute favorite moment of the Adventure Zone, any campaign, any arc? It doesn't have to have been your oh, character. Boy. And Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of content to parse through, but... Uh, I can actually, I have one that has never really <clears throat> uh, changed. Um, I really think Arms Outstretched mm -hmm. from Balance was for me um, because it, it was a really cool moment. I love the fact that it was all three of the characters kind of really and truly coming together like they had never come together before. Um, and it was just so much really cool energy for something that was, could have been incredibly chaotic and destructive to Griffin's storyline. Mm -hmm. I mean, he showed a lot of flexibility and resiliency in, in letting it go, but it, 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 it was it was one of the first times, not the first time, but one of the first times where, to me anyway, I went, wow, this is really something special. And it was, to me, it was it was a defining moment, but it was also just incredibly cool. It was kind of moving and at the same time, really exciting. Um, my answer is normally I'm not sure. Uh, one of the this is so a uh, self set like I, it's me. It's something I did. Um, but it's it's That's fine. It really is once again a, a good combination of like of things coming together because it's like mag I don't want to spoil anything, but it's a Magnus like in in his temporary form, um, like fighting a bunch of dudes uh, like alongside the the void fish like that to me was just such a fun the way that that all played out like was so much fun and like it, it was like a really cool action sequence that like didn't feel like cool for cool's sake it felt like really like organically like just being in the moment and like a fun like to the point where like the more the every time i think about it i think like I wish I could see it play out. And who knows? We're developing a pilot for an animated series. So maybe one day we do I have a close second, too. I know you only asked for one, but oh, let me yeah. give you a, clo a close second. Uh, Ned and Aubrey's final scene in Amnesty was important to me. I think to Trav, too, because <laughs> it was... It was it was something we had looked forward to. It was something we had seen coming. We had not talked about what we were going to do. It just really developed organically. And uh, that to me was a very close second because it was really powerful stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a question that might be, I don't know. Uh, I guess it won't be too uh, inflaming. It just who is your favorite PC of any of the campaigns other than any of your own? Oh, other than our own. Yeah. Uh, Duck Newton. I love Duck Newton so very much. Uh, I mean, listen, I love talking. That's the thing is, it, there's none of these characters that I don't love, it's right? Hard. I love all of them. But Duck Newton as, like, the, the like, hesitant hero is like so and I'm just like I don't know and just like Justin played it so well of just like never being a coward and never be I mean he and and like I guess Taco is a bit of a hesitant hero well as well but Taco was a show off mm -hmm. where Taco was just like 
all right, I guess. And like, it, it also was like, because we were playing, we were playing in, you know, set in West Virginia and dad's character wasn't very West Virginia. And my character wasn't very West Virginia, but Duck Newton was like super West Virginia. And I love it. Cause it was just like, it was like people I have known in my life were like, man, I don't know. All right. <laughs> I guess we're going to go. Like, yes, I loved it. Um, I, gosh, I tell you, one of my favorite PCs was uh, not, probably not as w- well known, but was uh, Shoots McCracken uh, <laughs> from, from Hootie and the, uh, from uh, Taz Hoot Nanny. Uh, yeah. It was <laughs> just, it, when we do those, when we do those kind of one offs, when we do, which ended up being a two off, but in, when we do one of those one offs, it, I mean, we're not so worried about continuity. We're not so worried about telling a story. We're just worried, you know, all we want to do is just have a good time. And and Sh- Shoots McCracken was just such a great concept. And, yeah. it and was it was one of those that, like when the concept came to me, I was like, I love this so much. It's just uh, I, he's based on like Mad Dog McCree, uh, just this like quick draw like robot kind of game. Who's the game? Yeah. Yeah. It's really fun. Cool. Plus, I get to do like stage makeup for it which I yeah love. and so yeah i i love shoots mccracken <laughs> yeah uh <laughs> so um i'm gonna try to kind of alternate between uh show questions and personal questions if that's okay with you um clint or travis i know you play animal crossing oh yes clint i've seen you retweet some animal crossing things I, do you play animal crossing also <laughs> Oh yeah, oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, okay. I just don't awesome. get invited to all the fun group <laughs> things because they know I'd completely smash you're them. Like you're like a week behind us, and so like you're still figuring. Stuff I got, out. I got my first Star Wand today. But, yeah, I got my first Star and Wand, and I got my fir- and I got my first uh, turnip. Turnips? Is it turnips? Yeah, turnips. I got my you first turnips today. today. Man, I've made millions in the stock market. What are you talking about? You're so far behind. Stock market. I just got that. I just now got that. I, uh, yeah. Well, somebody in chat real quick. Uh, I do have my own Animal Crossing question. Uh, but somebody did ask what Clint's town name is. Uh, and I would also like to know Travis's if that's okay. Oh, mine's Cool Town. Cool Town. Awesome. And, and mine's Bottlenose after Bottlenose Cove where awesome. Merle lived. Uh, yeah, in retrospect, I would go back and change mine. <laughs> I had no contact. Like, I was like, uh, because like the first eight names I tried to put in were too long. And I was like, uh, I don't know, cool town. And now it's like, oh shit. I wish I could go back and undo that. Ooh. Yeah, I love it. Um, but this, so this is one question that my, my wife really wanted me to ask. Uh, I, I let her sneak one in. She wanted to know both of yours, uh, your favorite villager in Animal Crossing Blathers. Blathers. Oh, you like the you like. The I love museum. Blathers, the museum owl, because it is the only consistent presentation of dad humor <laughs> in the entire game. Nobody puns, nobody does dad jokes like Blathers, and I find that very inclusive. Um, uh, my favorite. I had to look it up because I remembered his name, but I couldn't remember like the actual word. So Zucker. Who is a little octopus dude, and he's supposed to look like oh. I'm probably gonna mispronounce this, but tak- Takayaki, Takayaki, whatever, Takoyaki, sure. But he is very weird, and I love him very much. And he'll routinely say like, "Oh, I slept in this morning," but that's okay because it gave the bugs extra time to whisper things in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> Doctor? Are you cool? And I love it. I love it. I'm uh, a little behind on animal crossing knowledge i i started my island and then my wife really started playing more than me so she deleted my island because you can only have one on a switch and she made her own i logged in once and i shook a tree and she kicked me out and apparently you're not supposed to shake trees for fruit no that's not true okay well you you shake those trees adam her name's Brittany. you guys can you guys yell at her real quick Brittany? come on give him a break hold hold on hold on i am going to cut Brittany some slack because it's possible that Brittany was like trying to build a grove or possibly like organize, like I'm going to have a harvest on this day. So they all are coming back at the same time and get on a cycle. 
and maybe you messed that up, Adam. Is that possible? She just said it took me three days to grow that, so I don't know what that. Ooh. So ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So and Switch lights are sold out everywhere. She won't let me play on her island anymore. So I haven't got to oh. play yet until I can find a Switch. That's bad because I'm 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 saying maybe you're really bad at Animal Crossing because I made a house <laughs> for BB and BB's allowed to play on my island and she's three and a half, Adam. I think that probably is saying more about me than about Brittany. But, but by God, she doesn't shake any trees. <laughs> no, Bibi doesn't. She mostly just wants to explore my house or sit at the airport. That's Bibi's favorite thing is sitting at the airport and just <laughs> waiting for the plane. Because that's what we do a lot or did a lot before, uh, mm -hmm. you know, global pandemic shutdown is like we traveled a lot. Bibi really likes being at airports and like mm -hmm. being at hotels and stuff. And so this was like her kind of like. Uh, temporary stopgap of like, well, I could sit at a pretend airport at least. And she <laughs> loves it. I have a hat for her, by the way. Next time, oh, it on over. Next time around, it's a night helmet. I'll come over. It's a oh, night nice. helmet. I just, uh, we made a house for Teresa too. Teresa's going to start playing on my island. Yeah. Teresa will actually play, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Travis, I mean, you mentioned, you know, the quarantine and everything that's going on right now. Has that, or I'm sure it has, how has that? affected um not just your show schedules obviously live shows and things like that but also your personal lives how are you kind of adjusting to that uh dad <laughs> being away being away from my kids and grandkids yeah because i'm such i'm i'm so lucky in that i get to spend so much time mm -hmm. with my kids and my grandkids i mean through the live shows and everything else and the fact that you know don't live that far away from travis and and Teresa and BB and Dot right now, yeah. or from from Justin and Sydney and and Charlie and Cooper, but I can't go there. I I can't have you know physical contact with them, and I I yeah. that that is really been the the toughest thing. You know, I'm lucky in the fact that Carol and I are kind of sequestered together, so uh, you know we you know have been spent a lot of great time together. I mean, we don't have any choice, um, but for me, just being away from from the guys and uh, the grandkids is is that's that's been tough and i'm not gonna lie it's gonna I, i'm looking forward to that day when that has passed and we can uh you know get on with things yep. yeah yeah whatever uh, form we have um it, i think that this is like the last five weeks has been i think the longest i have gone without seeing my brothers in like four or five years uh, cause like we tour usually once a month or like, I'll go visit Justin or like something where we, like, we spend a lot of time together and it's been hard not to do that. Um, and like, I also do a lot of like conventions and live shows and stuff. So I usually get some FaceTime with the audience that I haven't gotten. And I, I miss that. Like yeah. very energizing creatively to get to interact with, you know, with your audience and like do live shows and all that stuff that's just be like, oh yeah, this is this is my office, you know, this is my workplace is like getting to, you know, talk to them and actually like talk to people. And so not being able to do that is really hard. And it, it's also like the nature of our jobs is like planning for the future and working on big projects that will pay off for like two years. And now we're in this time of like, who knows what it's gonna look like in two years. Right. And so there's been a lot of like, we can only go so far down the path towards planning stuff before it's like, and now we put pause on this for six months until we see what everything looks like, which is very stressful. Now to, to just to qualify things, we are still so much better off than so many yeah, other we're people. Very lucky. We are very lucky in the fact that uh, the main things that we do for a living right now are things that we can do from home. Right. And we are also extremely lucky in that we are all healthy and, and safe. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sobering to know that there are an awful lot of people who... <laughs> and I think that we need to continue to just try to do little things to try to, you know, stay in touch, do things. We, um, we had a... Uh, um, we, we all watched the premiere of Trolls 2 together all at the same time. We all tuned in at one o'clock yeah. and got on, you know, FaceTime and all the other stuff and talked back and forth. You know, you got to do things like that, stay in touch. I, 
you know, stay in touch, check in on people that you, you know and love. We've been playing Uno on the phone with people. I didn't know oh. you could do, yeah, there, you can play Uno and card <laughs> games and you've got to be creative and, and come up with things, you know, things to do. Um, but yeah, it's tough, but it's a lot tougher for an awful lot of people. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, you mentioned trolls, so that's going to bring me... I know it, um, we're due for an Adventure Zone question, but uh, Travis, we know you're going to be in Trolls 3, of course. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. Uh, Clint, what about you? I'd rather uh, not talk about it, Adam. <laughs> I'd rather not... No, Dad, a... good. now that we've got a little bit of pull, yeah. I think we can get you in, Dad. No, get... Hey, shut never... up! Don't twist my arm, but like now... And you're just now telling me this? Now? Well, I'm saying for Trolls 3. Yeah. Well, I can wait. Yeah. That's, okay. I've lived, I've lived almost 65 years now. I can hold out for a little while longer. Okay. But I want something really good. I want to. I want. Oh, something. that I can't guarantee. <laughs> Maybe you can play Branch's dad. Oh. Uh, that'd be a big. I get. could do that. Branch doesn't have a dad in continuity. Now we can get you a bit. That's a big get. Is... I'll write it. I'll write the. I'll write the part. I'll, let me get on that. Right okay. Yeah. Okay. He's, he's writing dad. it. He's writing. Okay. You all uh, go ahead with whatever it is you're doing. Cool, oh, cool. Branch's dad, Bud. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. So okay, good. Bud. Look, yeah. it's writing itself. Wow, uh, finally, uh, that botany class I took in college <laughs> paid off. <laughs> so uh, now to a, an Adventure Zone question. Um, I guess it's kind of an Adventure Zone. Travis, for you, it might also be a, a, a Bim Bam. Um, do you guys have any... When you're doing a live show, mm -hmm. is there... Or even even... Uh, just recording an episode do you guys have any kind of like pre-recording or pre-live show rituals that you swear by or that you have to do for either of those uh dad you can go first uh i have two things that i do uh i well for one thing i didn't used to ever uh take notes that lasted about the first three episodes uh <laughs> but then i got into this thing i do two things um as my children will tell you, I have sometimes trouble with character voices. So I started getting uh, Funko Pop figures. I don't know if you can see up there. There's some of them up there. Like I got mm -hmm. one of Brian Blessed uh, to remind me to do Ned's voice and uh, a couple other ones. And then I have that. I usually set that out. I've got uh, uh, Quint from Jaws because I try to do kind of a Robert Shaw voice a little bit with okay. uh, with Angus, but the thing I got, I mean, for Argo, this is, I found this, I got this at uh, Dragon Con, and Ooh. it's like an astrolabe. Have, uh -huh. you, have you ever uh seen that, Trav? No, it's cool. So I, I keep that right here. I, the, I mean, I kind of do the same thing. I got a Peppa teapot right there. Nice. I got some Peppa. Peppa. Uh, some pe no, these are just things my daughter has left on my desk. Your ritual is probably a lot different when you're DMing, though, isn't it? Uh, no, I mean, the thing is, is like, for, uh, I mean, little things, these aren't even that fancy, it's just like cleaning my desk off before we record, like that kind of stuff, but for live shows, um, you know, we, we will, uh, we sign posters at the shows, and like, we put on music and playlists for that, and like, we basically listen to the same playlist every time. Uh, and that helps. And like Justin and Griffin and I, John Hodgman taught us about like power posing of just like standing like with your arms up like this or like putting them on your hips. So we'll like power pose backstage just before we walk on. Uh, and I mean, it really we, helps. Yeah. We tell each other we love each other before each show. Uh, and we buy it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that kind of thing. You know, it's not a lot of, there's not a lot of like, uh, what's the word, like superstition stuff. It's mostly just like, these are the things we need to do in order to go out and do a good show. So, Oh, that's like the one fun thing on our writer. Hey, do you want to learn something about writers that I it. didn't know until I started doing live shows, Adam? Uh, the, the artist pays for their own writer. So if you ever hear like somebody say like, oh, they had like the most ridiculous like writer set, like you had to bring couches in. They were paying, like, the theater doesn't pay for that. So if Beyonce's like, I need you to set up an exact replica, one for one, of Pee Wee's Playhouse in my dressing room, Beyonce oh. paying for that to happen. Um, but the, like, the only kind of weird thing on our writer is like, 
requesting like local like desserts, local delicacy, whatever, like the local sweet like, treat. Yeah, it's like if you're gonna go, you have to stop by such and such as donuts. Mm. You gotta grab like this like kettle corn from this place, like that. We request that. that and that's about it. Hi, Carol. Hi, Lovey. How are you? I'm doing great. We're doing a live stream thing. It's nice to see you. He's doing a live thing. He just wants you to know. Okay. Just good to He's see you. Thank okay, you. Thank you. <laughs> I do have. Um, so I got a question. I think it's a little bit more Travis focused, but that's okay because then I'm going to pivot after that and it's going to be a, a Clint focused one. Uh, Travis, for graduation, um, how long prior to starting, like the first time you sat down and actually recorded episode one, mm -hmm. how long before that were you working on graduation and how much, it's kind of a two parts question, how much of the story did you have before you sat down for that first episode? So I, I had the idea for it seven months before we recorded. Um, and then like, May, so that would have been five months before we recorded, like me and Justin and Griffin and dad, like all went out to dinner together when we were recording for Dimension 20 and like talked through the idea and kind of hammered out a lot of the like details of it. And so then after that was like, what, what I really tried to do in figuring out the story was figure out big amorphous kind of end that I would be building to hypothetically but mostly it was like world building for me because i didn't want to figure out too much story stuff because i want to be able to like pivot and make decisions and change things of like oh yeah yeah that's great so like a lot of the stuff that's happened in 12 episodes is like i didn't know you know five months ago that that was going to happen um it's just like i know i know what the world looks like and i know like i know the destination but i don't have a map to put it that way like i have a compass but no map um, and so I know a lot of like the big ideas and I know the rules of the world, uh, but I'm still kind of figuring out the story episode to episode, frankly. Yeah. Uh, and then Clint for graduation, what made you choose a rogue, uh, out of all the 12 plus D and D classes? Um, we, we had, uh, like Travis said earlier, we do a lot of conventions and a lot of, you know, live appearances, a lot of Q and A's. And that was something that just kept coming up. People said, you need a rogue. Why don't you have a rogue? You, you... <laughs> and we never, I don't think, I, I don't know what, maybe in Taz nights, we, we had a rogue or two, but it just always seemed like there were situations that came about, especially during balance when we were heavy, you know, when we were doing D and D where a rogue would have come in very handy. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, but the I, problem is that because we're only three player characters is yeah. that if you have a tank and a rogue, you either have a caster or a healer. Yes. And yeah. so going into this, I said, except like, don't worry because the nature of it being a school where I can partner you with lots of other like players, lots of other NPCs pick whatever class you want. And yeah. and I and also I didn't have much experience in playing a rogue. I barely have any experience playing a cleric. Um, but it was just uh, kind of fun to. I, I wanted to try something different, try something new, and it was you know kind of fun to to uh, to play. I wanted to play a character that was kind of good at melee. I mean, even though it was stealthy, roguish kind of stuff, and. Uh, and it just seemed like there were a lot of story opportunities. Plus, I'm, I mean, I actually started with the, what is it, archetype, and then worked my way backwards because I wanted to be a swashbuckler. Mm. I wanted him to yeah. be a swashbuckler, and you get there through Rogue. So that was that was, that was why. I mean, I'm of the opinion that when it comes to, like, D&D classes, like Rogue, Bard, and maybe, like, Paladin, I think, in in – the like very nature of the class is some of the more fun to play in conversational scenarios. Like I, I think where maybe a rogue isn't as versatile in combat, 
their ability to like do deception checks and persuasion checks and performance checks and like all of those things like it it you will have a much easier tavern experience with a rogue on your team than you will with like a fighter on your team you will have a much easier like heist like sneaking your way into a castle talking your way into a party all of those things man i've i've been and dungeons and dungeons too how many times you run into a locked door or a puzzle needs to be solved but but unfortunately i think the four main kind of like roles that you need in a party if you have four players you should have a tank a caster a healer and a finesse is what i've taken to calling it where it's just like a rogue or a ranger or like even a monk, something like that, right? And then the fifth one is like your support characters, where it's just like, uh, you know, like a a, a druid, um, anybody who can like buff, basically. Um, and in, I'm getting into a lot of game theory, here, <laughs> but unfortunately, when you only have three, the one you lose is the finesse character. You know, it's hard to justify. Like, well, we've got a barbarian. And we've got uh, a wizard, and so I'm gonna play a ranger. It's like, oh, but we could really use a priest. Yeah. Oh, if you could, oh, if you could just, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's my answer to your question, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, the only three player. I I don't think I know another podcast that has just three players in it. So that's definitely kind of a unique situation. Uh, you all part of the reason we're so bad at this. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is like it does. It makes for some interesting DMing oh, yeah. challenges, right? Where it's just like I, I have to, and I'd like Griffin can attest to this too. Like I have to think in terms of like I don't want to overwhelm. And like the thing is, like for example, if we were still playing without a rogue, and you present like here is a locked door that is like a really hard check to get past. They're not getting past it, right? Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, I need to think into... And, like, right now, what I'm running into, God bless them, is that none of the three of my players know anything about Arcana. And so it's like, I can't do tough... Like, uh, even though, like, two of them are technically casters, yeah. <laughs> I can't do, like, tough magic puzzles because they don't know that, right? And so it's like really having to... You know, it's like it's like cooking in the quarantine. Where you have to look and see what the ingredients are, and then decide what you're going to make instead of the other way around. That is a good. That is a good analogy. Yeah, even though, yeah, uh, it's it's funny to hear, you know, uh, Griffin, you know, kind of being a caster, and then he always mentions that his intelligence is like a negative one or something. Uh, so that's well, what's it's great about that is that it's not only like it presents a really organic kind of chaos where like. He is a caster, but he he not only it's not the player knows what he's doing. Yes, the character doesn't. Yeah, and so like anything can happen, and it it makes it like it's makes for very organic story moments of just like what was that? And it's like yeah, I know, right? And like I I think that's incredible. Yeah, uh, I do want to before we cut over to uh, uh, Twitch uh, chat questions, I. I have one more question that I think is a pretty good question. I think one of our patrons asked this, um, and I, I did think that it was very relevant. So um, you all obviously didn't start as a role-playing podcast. You know, Travis, you had you, you all had other uh, projects before that. But with the addition of you all uh, taking on that role-playing uh, project, and then now you're all in just all kinds of different media, uh, voice acting, a TV show, um, how has role playing in a tabletop game system helped transition over to that? Has it given you any skills that you think were beneficial or Oh yeah. I I, I mean Dad can can probably speak to this better because he takes lead on adapting the graphic novels, but like storytelling in such a collaborative setting as uh like the adventures on any RPG real play podcast like it makes it it builds a lot of trust with like with your co-writers basically and for me personally it's given me a lot of confidence as a storyteller and like as a writer that i didn't have before because it lets me write in a medium that i'm very comfortable with which is talking uh 
yeah, so that's my dad. What about you? Yeah, I think that it it, it really uh, helps with improvisational skills, um, and it's for me it was kind of a it wasn't that big a transition because I did uh, morning radio for forty four years and always did morning shows which were very comedy oriented, very bit oriented, very character oriented. You know, it created a whole bunch of different characters that interacted sometimes with each other. Um, and so that was kind of a natural transition into, you know, the, the, the role playing. Um, and I think the fact that all three of the guys and, and me too have uh, such a, um, I don't know if I would say strong, but a pretty consistent theater background. They all grew up in theater. I got um, my degree in it. You got his degree in it. And that's how serious he was about it. So we were all very, theater based and so i think at the very heart of live theater is collaboration and there is nothing more collaborative than a, you know an rpg game with with friends or maybe even people that aren't your friends the the collaboration that you have to do not only the collaboration between the characters but the collaboration between performers which is creating that's what you're doing when you're playing a game you are creating a story you're being a storyteller and so you know, I, I think that lends itself to storytelling very much. Yeah. All right. Uh, I know we've only got about 15 minutes left of your all's time, so I do want to uh, get into some of these uh, Twitch questions that are coming in. Um, crit. Oh, no. Why isn't it letting me scroll up? Uh, crit. I, I missed the name, but I asked, uh, what was the best local food you ever had? Uh, Any city or state? Man, uh, oh, what is it? Blue Blue Star Donuts, I think, oh. in Portland. Where was Those that? Really, really good. I think that's it. Blue Star or One Star or something. There's something Star Donuts in Portland were really, really good. Um, and along the same lines, when we were in New Orleans, we got the, the beignets oh, yeah, yeah, from yeah. whatever the beignet place is. I, I don't remember <laughs> what it is now. But there's one place everybody says, you got to go. And every time we go there, there was a line you know, two days long. And so we said, oh, well, I guess we missed our chance. And then they brought a box of those beignets. Uh, oh, cool. I, awesome. I don't remember what it, what that was, but uh, we also get a lot of meals. Oh, it was, the place was called Beignet and the Jets. That was, oh, you, that took you about 45 seconds to come Thank up you. with. Yeah. Well, <laughs> beignet is a hard word to pun. <laughs> <laughs> Rosalia R. asked uh, for Travis, uh, who were the first few uh, Taz graduation NPCs you came up with? Uh, actually, Buckminster Eden mm -hmm. existed. I, I guested on uh, the Broadswords podcast, mm -hmm. and he was the NPC, or he was the PC I played there. And basically, I created this like charlatan rogue, and his stats were such that he could talk his way out of anything. But if he didn't, he could not fight at all he would die hands down like he had no combat skills whatsoever and i had so much fun playing him that i was like i'm going to include him in this school uh and so i think it was actually probably buckminster and rainier uh the necromancer uh because i was just like i based rainier off my friend uh rachel minor and i was like this is that's that's her it was just like i just have so much fun being around Rachel and she's such a positive like light in the universe that I was like I just want a character in the game that is her uh, and so that's what I did and by the way those beignets came from Café du Monde oh, there oh you go. That, yeah um, Dragonbait asks how often do you all record um... uh, so my brother my brother and me we do every Thursday uh, Schmanners we do every Thursday Adventure Zone, we do every other Tuesday the week before it comes out. Okay. So we'll record Tuesday morning and then have like 10 days or something before it comes out. And then like four days later, we'll record again. Uh, I'm going to give Dragon Bait uh, a second question. They also asked uh, if you could change one thing about something in the past arcs or current arc uh, or campaign, what would you change? If anything, uh, I'm, I'm, all right. My take on it is I don't. I'm not a big believer in regretting your decisions, 
and wanting to make changes like that. I think that um, if we were to make changes, I think it would would alter what it was. Yeah. And I, I like the fact that, you know, we you make the best decision you can with the information you have, you know, in at, at your fingertips and you just live with it. I don't I can't think of anything I would have would would have changed. Oh, I, I'll, I'll I, change I, one thing. Yeah. In the very first episode of Adventures on Balance, I made a joke comment that Magnus had some like dirty drawing like a drug <laughs> or something. Yeah. That was just like a weird thing I said. And then like so so long later, somebody's like, why did he have those if he's still in love with his wife? And Paul was like, I don't know. It's good. <laughs> and I so if I could go back in time, I would I would cut that line forever. Well yeah. Uh, he he could have just given gotten them from Merle. Yeah. Well, at, the, at the time you also didn't realize I don't think how big the adventure zone was really going to no, take off. No, we didn't think we didn't know there was going to be a second episode, yeah. Adam. Yeah. So yeah, that definitely explains it. Um, let's see. We've got a uh, busy parsley ask with being so in touch with your family, um, who are also your players. How do you manage to not spoil anything in conversation with each other? Oh, we only talk when we record. No, uh, <laughs> I mean it's yeah. tough. Frank, frankly, I like we don't unless it is an explicit like I I'm going. Is there anything you want to do in this next episode, or if you were presented with this, what options would you want? Unless we're talking about like I I want to set you up for success, kind of discussions. We don't talk about the story. I mean, it's because when we were first planning out, uh, like, I, I got these like things that clicked in the world or clicked in the store. I was like, ah, yes, there it is. Got it. And I couldn't tell them. I couldn't be like, guys, I, f I broke it. I got it. Right. So like, I would just tell Teresa and Teresa who doesn't listen to the adventure zone would be like, oh, cool. That's great. That's going to be really fun. <laughs> so like, that, like that would get it out of my system. Yeah. 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 And, and I think that that, if we did have any discussions, I think it would really change the very nature of what it is, because it, when we first started, a big thing that we tried to do, Travis and Justin and I really tried to screw with Griffin's narrative. I mean, we make no bone, <laughs> yeah. no, 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 no jokes about. It. I mean, because I mean, that's what we we were having fun. We were I, doing I, that. I like to think of it this way: it's like you know, it's like we were. He was a defender, right? And we're like the running back, and we're like trying to do spin moves around him. So that we can keep moving forward with the thing we want to do. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of that. I'm just like, we weren't trying to do it to break the game, but it was more like, ah, you didn't see this coming, did you, Griffin? <laughs> so we have to kind of balance because we don't want it. I mean, I mean, we've had a lot of people ask us in Q and A sessions. You know, what if you get somebody that just keeps trying to break the story and keeps trying to mess up what you're trying to do? And and we have slightly different job descriptions. We have to create. A story we have to create a narrative it, we're not just you know playing the game we're playing the game but at the same time we have to you know be cognizant that we're telling a bigger story a a, a longer a longer con so yeah. to speak and and so that kind of dictates th that a little bit more and i think we've 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 toned down the anarchy a little bit although it's still there um but now it's it's more challenging for us to come up with more creative ways to to bust the tropes rather than just do the same thing over and over again. Um, Son of Jock Jams asked a fun question. Uh, what is your favorite magical item or weapon in Dungeons and Dragons? The flaming raging poisoning sword. <laughs> that we've used or just in general? Just in general, but that is a good one. It it's be hard not to, like it was such a, this is the thing about balance that, I think would be impossible for us to ever recapture. The lightning in the bottle of balance is like, because we had no idea what it would turn out to be, right? We were never trying to like lay any kind of like, it, it, we weren't trying to make a pathway to something. And so like the first time we introduced the Flaming Raging po Poisoning Sword Dam, it was just as like a like throwaway fan servicey thing of like this kid, submitted this we're never going to use it but isn't that fun that the kid submitted this like ridiculously overpowered item and then it just kept kind of getting referenced and kept building to 
being one of the most like iconic, I think iconic moments oh, yeah. in the show and iconic weapons in the show. And it was like, but if we'd been trying to like lay the groundwork for that on purpose, I don't think it would have worked out the same way. You know, and so like we, now as we do these arcs, we're like trying to like trying to like purposefully lay groundwork in a way that doesn't make it look like we're laying groundwork. And if only we could recapture the sheer ignorance we had doing it the first. I believe in us. I know we can, Trav. I believe we can. <laughs> do you still have the the flaming raging poisonous sword of doom that? Uh... Oh, the guy from uh, MythBusters made you. Uh, oh, yeah, I lost him. Oh, wait, he's getting it. It's right here. Here. <laughs> <laughs> you can't who, even see the whole thing on the camera. Who was it? Who was it that made it? Uh, a woman named Lauren, uh, who works with Grant Imahara, and Grant Imahara and Lauren help make it. Yeah, you can't see that. This is the handle when it's charged up to. Uh, the battery's not charged, but this lights up. This has like like light effects that run through it, and the stall in the handle lights up. Oh, that is fantastic! The poisonous stinger on the end here. That is fantastic. Um, so I know. Oh wait, wait, Clint, we did not get your favorite. Uh, the adamant spanner. Yeah. Uh, the adamant spanner that uh, that not only works as a weapon but also as a repair device. Uh, as a matter of fact. I was just our our third graphic novel, uh, Petals of the Metal, will be coming out uh, in st in July. Still, right, Trav? Yes, still coming out in July, and uh, the Adamant Spanner makes its debut in that, and it just it reminded me how much I how much I love that thing. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, I want to be uh, respectful of your all's time. I know we've only got five minutes left, so I want to give you guys five minutes. That um, anything that somehow we missed, you all getting a chance to plug. Um, or where can everybody find you all? Uh, I've got something that I'm that I'm doing with my wife Carol uh, on the McElroy family YouTube channel. Okay. Every evening at 5:30 p.m. Eastern, uh, we've been reading a chapter of a book. Uh, we oh, we yeah. we did uh, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Did a chapter a night, and we just wrapped that up about uh, three nights ago. And uh, we started doing Coraline by Neil Gaiman. Mm -hmm. We're up to uh, chapter four tonight, but that's every evening at five thirty. Just something that people can tune in, and and I'm doing Neil Gaiman because Neil Gaiman has given permission to people to read his works during the uh, during the quarantine, which was awfully amazing uh, for him. But it's just like your grandma and grandpa reading a story to you, and a lot of folks go to it, and and, and we've been very very pleased with that. It's just a little something we wanted to do to help folks get through these screwy times what else we got going on travis uh i mean yeah you could just check out everything else on the macroy youtube uh macroy family there's like some cooking things i did on there some baking things uh there's like a tour of my animal crossing island from like <laughs> i don't know a week or two ago so it's pretty outdated now there's going to be a new one soon griffin's live stream there justin just did like a geocaching live stream there um Sydney did a great one about, I mean, a serious one about wearing uh, the masks. Yeah, mm -hmm. good mask procedure. Good to mask follow. procedures. Yeah. Um, you can uh, go to macroy.family. That's our website. And uh, check out all the podcasts and stuff we do. Uh, like I said, we do My Brother, My Brother, and Me is the one me and my brothers do. Uh, Adventure Zone is the actual play podcast that me and Dad and Justin and Griffin do. And Schmanners, we've been having a lot of fun with lately. Uh, my wife and I, we talk about. Uh, the history of certain, like, of different etiquette kind of things and how it still applies now. And it is a completely non-judgmental podcast where basically the, the thing that we realize talking about it is that etiquette exists to help navigate awkward social situations. And there will be people who use it to judge other people. But the reason it really exists is like, hey, I have to go to this thing and I don't know what to do. Okay, cool. Just follow these rules and you'll get through it, I promise. And so, like, we just did one that I, I found fascinating, where we talked about uh, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter, and about, like, his life and his legacy and, like, his impact on, like, culture and society and stuff. Uh, and it was really, really interesting. Also, Justin and Sydney do a podcast called Sawbone. <laughs> Griffin and Rachel do a podcast called Wonderful. Hey! Hey! 
Clint. You're giving away my time, Clint. We, we got a, we we have a graphic novel coming out in yes. July. We just mentioned with uh, First Second and the incredible Carrie Peach. Um, that uh, it's it it really picks up in number three. And as Trav said, we're working on a an animated TV show. Um, you can you can go really to fun. theadventurezonecomic.com to pre-order that graphic novel. Uh, and I believe the first two, you can order from a lot of different places. Uh, the first one is the uh, the Adventure Zone, Here There Be Gerblins. And the second one is the Adventure Zone, Murder on the Rockport Limited. Get yours today! Yeah, and then, uh, so that animated series... Oh, hi, Dad! He wants to show the graphic novels. I thought he was just like, that's yeah, too... I'm out. It's 159. I'm out. I'm done. They are fantastic. Um, so, uh, an plug. animated series, uh, is there an ETA on that? or No, no, who knows? Okay. Uh, there so was! <laughs> Oh yeah, that's true. Oh, I guess it's not really <laughs> sense. He's joking. Uh, so uh, yeah, seriously, thank you two so much. Um, you two, uh, along with obviously uh, Griffin and Justin, also were absolutely huge inspirations. You're actually, uh, I'm gonna you know uh, fan out a little bit real quick. Uh, you're actually the f reason I got into D and D. I was oh, uh, always wanting to play D and D, never knew how. So I started looking up D and D podcasts, found a couple out there, was listening. I enjoyed them enough, and then I wanted to run Lost Mine of Fandelver. So I looked up Lost Mine of Fandelver Dungeons and Dragons podcast, found the Adventure Zone. Three, <laughs> three episodes in, I was like, I don't think this is Lost Mine of Fandelver, really. Um, but still, stuck along with it because at that point I had been hooked. So uh, yeah, you two were uh, a huge part in what got me into D and D, and I think a lot of people. I talk a lot of to a lot of people that don't even play Dungeons and Dragons or tabletop RPGs and yet they still listen to the Adventure Zone even if they it's it's crazy the the impact you all have had. So again, uh thank you all. Oh, Travis McRoy just donated $632 to our amazing cause. Um yeah, we are at 2632 uh 2632 out of we just up we've quad or uh double the goal I think four times now. Because we keep smashing it. So thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to let you two get going. And uh, again, thank you all thank so much. Thank yeah. you so much for having us. Thank you for letting us be a part of this and help raise money for a great cause. And even though we're leaving, everybody else stay. Uh, keep watching. Donate. Uh, support. Do all that stuff. You you are great. Yes. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. Thank you, Adam. Bye, everybody. Bye.